Hello, happy Wednesday. I am Philosophical and... Ananda. Ananda, and we are here in Peaceburg, the glorious Peaceburg, under this glorious sunshine. And we are going to be reading part two of a magnificent essay called Crossing the Threshold. We're going to cross the threshold together, and this is written by one of our favorite authors named Charles Eisenstein. We made part one to this video a while ago, and we're very happy to be making part two right now. And so to briefly summarize before we catch up to where we left off, this essay is talking about how we can cross the threshold into the more beautiful world that we know is possible and that we may have glimpsed in certain places or experiences. Um, and this is just a very fascinating analysis of how we can do that and kind of some of the history of what's led us to this present moment. So we are going to play popcorn with this beautiful essay and read back and forth. Um, would you like to start it off? I believe the first question is how? All right, thank you. Yes, indeed. Hello. So how can we make them, which is our She's talking about these peak experiences, yeah. these glimpses of the new world. How can we make those experiences into a new baseline for life? How can we enter into the world that they show us? How can we redeem their promise? How can we bring into living reality the knowledge that we have been shown something true and real? Each time the, or the old world drags us back. And the inertia of our habits and beliefs, the expectations of the people surrounding us, the way we are seen, the media, the pressures of the money system, they all conspire to hold us where we were. Coming off of a peak experience, we may try to insulate ourselves and uh, from all the things that bring us back and we try to live in a bubble of positivity and we eventually realize that it's impossible to do that because the negative influences find a way to creep back in. From the understanding of the connected self, this is entirely to be expected because you're not separate from me and you can't be fully healed until I'm fully healed and you can't be enlightened until I'm enlightened. This is the import, the import of the golden reminder and the bodhisattva realization that we described earlier in the last video. Each one of us is pioneering a different aspect of the connected self in the age of reunion and each one of us as well carries vestigial habits, I don't know what that word means so maybe you do, of the age of separation that are invisible to us or that if visible we're helpless to overcome on our own. Quite practically to inhabit a more enlightened state we must be held there by a community of new habits new ways of seeing each other, and new beliefs in action that redefine what's normal. Thank you. And I believe the word vestigial is like, s s we sometimes have vestigial organs. Those are little kids riding their tricycles having a wonderful time. Happy Wednesday! Um, so yeah, vestigial, I believe it means like, it's like these things that, that used to serve us, but now they're just like, extra. Um, some people think the uh, certain organs are vestigial organs. Anyway, here's a quick snout rocket. <laughs> Spit rocket. Okay, in other words, in the age of the connected self, our guru can be none other than a collective, a community. As Thich Nhat Hanh put it, the next Buddha will be a Sangha. Sangha means community. By community, I don't mean an, an amorphous, we are all one, mass devoid of structure, but rather a matrix of human beings united in a common story of the people and a story of the self. Aligned with these defining stories, this community can hold us in the vision 
of what we are becoming. Until recently, such a community barely existed. Either we were alone, gasping for breath in an ocean of separation, or we nurtured the new ways in isolated and insulated bubbles that, with rare exceptions, quickly popped. Such bubbles cannot last very long alone. Like soap bubbles, their substance evaporates unless replenished and sustained. Today it is different because these bubbles, Ken Carey's islands of the future in an ocean of the past, are appearing faster than they can pop, clumping together, strengthening each other, forming a connected matrix. We are reaching critical mass, a point where we can live so much surrounded by nascent institutions of the new world that we can stay there most of the time. No longer will we need to struggle to remember what those special experiences have showed us was true. Health and spiritual well-being are maintained through relationships and not through self-sufficiency. No one so enlightened <laughs> No one is so enlightened that they don't need help. Uh, rather, they're enlightened because they receive help, the help that they need. Enlightenment is a state of dependency. And to, to the extent that any other being that any other being is sick in any way, so is each of us. Every hurting person out there matches a hurting thing in here. It could be as subtle as a grain of sand in your sock, unnoticeable when major wounds are still hemorrhaging blood, but increasingly intolerable as the big wounds heal. As wholeness increases, these little things come into consciousness and become intolerable. We can no longer comfortably abide in our idyllic house with a view, eating health food and thinking positive thoughts. Our self-sufficiency is no longer sufficient when we feel the pain of the world echoing inside of ourselves. If we try to stay in the bubble of spiritual self-sufficiency, self the hurting of the world sneaks in, a vari in, a, in as various of the new diseases. The hurting of the world sneaks in as various of the new diseases, forcing itself upon our consciousness. Consider, for example, two of the most significant of the new diseases, which are MCS, multiple chemical sensitivities, and electromagnetic sensitivity. Toxic chemicals and EMFs are the physicalization of our negativity, as well as the byproduct of our mindset of separation that sees nature as an indifferent reservoir of our wastes for the chemically and for the chemically and electromagnetically sensitive no amount of retreat is enough trying to avoid negativity we have to retreat further and further until the repeated the repeated intrusion of the world upon our serenity makes us realize we have to cleanse the whole world of toxic chemicals and all they represent and not just The yogic teaching, don't try to cover up the world with leather, just wear shoes, served us well in the age of spiritual self-sufficiency, but it serves no longer, especially if taken to mean, heal thyself, the world is not your responsibility. That was true for a time. It was medicine. It healed us of self-rejection and self-sacrifice. It was a necessary stage towards the next step, when we do seek to heal the world, not as an act of self-sacrifice, not at the cost of our own well-being, but as a necessary step in our own self-healing. Through our relationship to the other, we heal ourselves. There is no other way. This realization often manifests as a desire to find one's true purpose in life, one's service to the world. Such a purpose is never just about the separate egoic self. It is always about service. It is about one's gifts and how to give them. 
Purpose is about gift and relationship. The emerging state of vitality, joy, and love that humanity is entering is not a place where we can abide for long on our own. We need each other. It's not only in spiritual life that this is true. The same shift is manifesting in economic life and our ecological relationships. Indeed, because spiritual well-being can only proceed to the next level through our relationships to other people, other beings in the planet, the very word spirituality, as distinct from social, economic, and material life, is losing its relevance. Built into the concept of spirituality is the idea that some areas of human life are not spiritual. That divide between spirit and matter, between the life of the soul and the life of the flesh is crumbling. High time, too, because look at the results of treating, peop treating the planet as not sacred. Look at the results of treating part of our own selves as profane. The war against the self and the conquest of nature, each mirroring the other, are coming to an end in our time as the institutions of the connected self wax stronger. Inter interdependency is something of a euphemism for what is really a form of dependency. The latter word, word is a trigger. Whether it's emotionally, financially, or spiritually, most people seek to avoid dependency. That, I'm sorry to say, is a conceit. By our nature, as ecological beings, we are helplessly dependent on other beings to survive, to thrive, even to exist. In the heyday of the age of science, we thought it human destiny to become independent of all other beings. We aspired to a wholly artificial world in which even f the food we would eat would be synthesized. The flesh transcended and death overcome. No longer we are learning, though, that painfully, our utter dependency on the rest of nature. <laughs> Interdependency is a subcategory of dependency in that it is mutual and multidirectional, but that doesn't make us any less dependent, and that's okay. To be dependent is to be alive. To be alive. It is to be enmeshed in the give and take of the world and when we allow ourselves to enter it, to realize the perceived safety of self-sufficiency, we access and can sustain an intensity of being and of love that we could only glimpse before. That is because we are encompassing more of our true connected being. We're be being more fully ourselves. Humanity collectively, and many of us individually, are at a threshold between worlds. The world we are entering is both a new world for us and a long-forgotten realm. As we step into it, we can be each other's welcoming committee. We can do for each other what a guru does for a disciple hold each other in the knowing of who we really are and teach each other how to live there. Each of us, as we experience our own piece of the age of reunion, becomes a guide to a small part of that vast new territory. And that is Crossing the Threshold by Charles Eisenstein, read by Philosophical and Ananda. Ananda, and we are very happy to be here in Peaceburg. Thank you, Will, for filming us. And if you'd like to read this whole essay, uh, you can check out charleseisenstein.net, also realitysandwich.com. And uh, good luck crossing the threshold. And um, we're all in this together. Let's remember that. I think that's the most. We are all thing. in this together. No one is alone. Not alone. And if you'd like to check out phil-osophical.com, that is a new website I've been working on. It's pretty neat. We've also got part one to this video, um, so we'll post a link to that. Have a beautiful